Let's talk about the long-toothed armies of Ross and the Allfather with an overview of Space Wolves in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Space Wolves, and in this video I thought we'd do a full overview of their army in the current game, talk through their index rules, all their units and other detachments, and how the armies of Fenris are faring on the tabletop at the moment. Over the past half a year or so, Space Wolves have had a fairly shaky start to 10th edition 40k. When their index first dropped, the vast majority of their units were kind of underpowered in the points department, and their champions of rust detachment, I must say, leaves a few things to be desired. Unfortunately, just not really generally considered strong compared with the other options inside Codex Space Marines. Now at the moment though, things have reversed a bit for them. Out of the various options for Codex Space Marines, Space Wolves seem to be performing second best out of the Divergent chapters, Black Templars are a bit ahead of them in tournament win rates, but the Space Wolves are around about 50%, in no small part helped out by the Stormlance Task Force, helping out their Thunderwolf Cavalry. In tournament games, they're winning around about half of games, so pretty well balanced in 40k at the moment. They've certainly been taking down a few big events with four big tournament wins since the balanced data slate, but their play rate does seem to remain at least fairly low, around about 20th out of the 26 major factions, depending on which numbers you look at. Overall, definitely seem at least fairly interesting, and they do have a number of cool units that they can bring to bear. In the video, let's take a look through their core rules, all the things in their Champions of Rust attachment, and then their data sheets, and finish up with a talk about some other Codex Space Marine options, both units and other detachments, and one strong example army list. Starting out with Index Space Wolves, their faction rule is Oath of Moment from the core Codex Space Marines, a bit toned down now it's just rolls to hit and not to wound. And then their Champions of Rust detachment has the similar sort of offerings to most of the other detachments out there. Only Space Wolf specific units can be used in the detachment, and a few other generic data sheets are locked out. Their core rule is the Deeds Worthy of Saga detachment rule. The idea that characters achieve some great feats and then help out the rest of the army as a result. They've got 6 stratagems and 4 enhancements. And then comparatively speaking, really quite a lot of unique data sheets compared with the other Divergent chapters, a massive 35 of them, with a big emphasis on characters. Beyond all this, they can use all the other detachments from Codex Space Marines of course, plus the generic data sheets. For choice of different ways that you could field them, they have perhaps some of the best choice in all of Warhammer 40k right now with their big number of unique things. Going through those rules one by one, and first up we have Oath of Moment. The standard Space Marine reroll rule, which means that in the command phase you get to target one enemy unit, and then all your units for the rest of the battle round can reroll hit rolls against that target. As ever, it's a solid focal damage buff, usually a 33% damage boost for a unit with a 3 plus to hit, which is the majority of Space Marines. Can be quite big with anything with lethal hits, where you could potentially fish for them if you wanted to. Though for the most part I would say it's maybe a little bit more relevant for shooting rather than combat. It definitely could be a big boost to a melee unit, and certainly get some enormous value out of it, but it's maybe a little bit easier to have this affect a good chunk of your army if you've got multiple different shooting units or focusing down one big threat. That tends to be a bit more common rather than multiple units charging them. Still though, given the power of Space Wolf melee units and particularly Thunder Wolves, it'll certainly make them hit far, far harder. Moving into the unique Champions of Rust detachment, compared with most other Divergent Chapter detachments, there are a few more restrictions there. As a standard thing that you can only take Space Wolf's unique units, so say no Rebute, Gilliam, or Normanius, Kalgar from the Ultramarines, or Death Company from the Blood Angels, that certainly makes sense, but otherwise it does lock out a bunch of other choices. You can't take any Tactical or Devastator squads, and you can't take the Apothecary, and it also still prohibits you from taking Assault squads or Command squads, in spite of the fact that both of those went to Legends now. Competitively speaking, I wouldn't say that any of those restrictions are actually all that a big deal. Tactical squads and Devastator squads just really aren't all that great. The Apothecary is also seldom played in competitive lists, and for the Tactical and Devastators, you do have the Space Wolf Unique versions with the Grey Hunters and the Long Fangs, which definitely have their selling points as alternatives. It is kind of interesting, though, that when they updated the ban list, as with the big chapter update, it didn't actually lock out any company heroes or jump intercessors from this. Kind of interesting that they chose to go that way, given that they're basically the spiritual successors of the command squad and the assault squad, but at the moment at least, there's absolutely nothing to stop you taking those units with the space wolves, and that's kind of nice given that both of those are useful enough. Otherwise, for what you actually get in the army, the core rule is the deeds worthy of saga. This one is a misleave, really quite fun and fluffy. The idea is that your characters try and achieve certain great feats, 
and then if they're successful, all the Depths of Astartes models on the tabletop gain a big benefit for the rest of the game, and they can be really quite meaningful damage or defensive buffs. You can only unlock them at the end of the battle round, so you can't just instantly do one with a character and then have the benefit for the rest of the turn, and you can only select one Saga each battle round, and each one once per battle. But it still means, theoretically, that if the stars aligned, you could potentially trigger one per turn, and then have four different special rules all stacking on each other by the end of battle round four. It is a bit of a double-edged sword, though, as most of the ways that you unlock these just aren't particularly reliable, and you are essentially starting out the game with zero detachment rules, and you're somewhat dependent on your opponents to try and make any of them happen. For those deeds, there are four of them. The saga for the warrior born happens if any Astartes character models from your army destroyed one or more enemy character models during a battle round, and the reward for that is quite good, meaning that the melee weapons for the rest of your army get sustained hits one for the rest of the game. Really quite a big reward there, and kind of makes sense for your character-led squads to go seeking out the enemy's character-led squads themselves. Will probably be easy to achieve against some armies, less so against others. The Saga of Majesty happens if you can manage to control your opponent's home field objective at the end of either player's turn, and you have to do it with a character unit. That's just a spectacularly hard to achieve quest, given that you'll probably have to go through most of their army to do so, unless you get lucky either super early in the game, or kind of late and they don't screen you out particularly well. If you achieve that, then the rest of the army all gets plus one objective control for the rest of the game. I'd say the reward for that definitely isn't terrible, but it's still not standout either. It potentially might flip an objective at some stage and earn you some more victory points, though I certainly wouldn't count on it. This one perhaps feels best for a stratagem that allows you to buy one in for a turn potentially. Next up, there's the Saga of the Bear. This happens if an Astartes character from your army was reduced to half or below their starting number of wounds during that battle round, but were not destroyed at the end of the battle round. So basically a character that was really quite heavily injured, but not quite outright killed. And if that happens, then you generate a 6 plus feel no pain for the rest of your army. Might be okay for things like Bjorn the Fell Handed, maybe. He maybe feels tanky enough that that might well happen just naturally. But for a bunch of other characters, it might be hit or miss. The opponent might just wipe them out outright or they might be able to just fall short and trigger it. The Feel No Pain is pretty handy though, quite good on big stuff, and fairly nice if you've got, say, two wound space marines being shot by plasma guns and things. Finally, we've got the Saga of the Beast Slayer. This happens if any Adeptus Astartes character models destroy one or more monster or vehicle models during the battle round. And if you manage to do that, then the rest of your army all gets the lethal hits keyword in melee, so it's going to make everything really quite good at punching up and killing yet more beasts or vehicles. Again, that one's kind of dependent on your opponent to be able to trigger that. You might be facing an army that literally has no monster or vehicles in it, so you're not getting that in that case. Feels like it could have potential, though, if you're playing, say, Imperial Knights or Chaos Knights. There's a pretty good chance that's going to trigger at some stage, while your big, scary character squads are wandering the board, and could be a really meaningful boost against the rest of the army after that. Overall, between all this, if you are playing Champions of Rust, then it encourages an army filled with characters, Maybe not too terrible, as that often works quite well for a fair few Space Wolf units anyway, particularly the Thunder Wolves, but also things like the Wolf Guard Terminators or the Blood Claws. I would say by far the weakest thing about this is just how unreliable literally every single buff is here. There's a good chance that you just never get the Saga of Majesty unless things are going very well in your way anyway. Both of the Slay things, ones being that your characters have to be in combat and kill something kind of important, that's probably not going to happen too early in the game, probably turn two at earliest, and only if you're lucky. And the Saga of the Bear is kind of dependent on your opponent to fluff killing a character. Could definitely happen just incidentally, and really quite big if it did, but could be kind of gamed around and say not try and take down a character Dreadnought, unless you're fairly sure that you've got enough firepower to finish the job. Moving on to stratagems, and as with the rest of the Space Marines, they get access to Armour of Contempt, 1 CP to reduce enemy AP by 1, really quite relevant on things like tough dreadnoughts with a 2 plus armor save, and particularly so if they can get cover, you could be saving last cannons and things on surprisingly high rolls. Otherwise though, for unique stuff, there's go for the throat for 1 CP, that's another battle tactic one, so again could be used for a wolf lord for free. That one gives you extra AP in melee, and if the saga of the beast slayer is active for the units, then melee weapons get lance as well. So basically going to be really quite a lot better if that saga is active, but kind of situational otherwise. Extra AP definitely isn't terrible though. If you've got a unit that's big and threatening enough fighting against something with a high save, it could well be worth it. 
For one CP, there's Runic Wards. This one gives you a 5 plus Feel No Pain type save against Psychic Attacks or Mortal Wounds, and it can only be used as a reaction to an actual attack, as opposed to something that just inflicts those for other reasons. This one gets improved to go off on a 4 plus if the Saga of the Bear is active. I guess that makes sense, given that that one already gives you a 6 plus Feel No Pain. Overall, this one does feel really quite niche now, given that Devastating Wounds aren't Mortal Wounds anymore. Could be alright if you've got a big amount of psyche attacks just about to be focused on one of your key units, maybe Magnus in Thousand Sons or Tyranid Zone Thropes or something. A 5 plus feel no pain usually equates to a 50% durability increase for that phase, so it definitely could be good for something if you're about to get hit by something really quite scary or an important unit. For 1 CP there's Warrior Pride, this one allows you to flex into one of the sagas that's not active yet, and you have to declare it in the command phase with a unit that's got an Adeptus Astartes character in it. This one's really quite fun and flexible. It could actually be perhaps biggest for the plus one objective control one for the Saga of Majesty. As you activate it in the command phase, if that mathematically makes the difference between holding an objective or having your opponent having stolen it off you, then that could be really quite huge and potentially worth five victory points then and there. Otherwise, lethal sustained hits both are okay and it could allow the boosted version of other stratagems out there, like say the Lance Melee one. I guess that could be kind of interesting to get the Beast Slayer one on the unit, get the lethal hits, and then also have Lance Melee and extra AP when you charge in, maybe as a free stratagem for a Wolf Lord. Outside of Captains and Wolf Lords though, it does mean that you'd be spending quite a lot of CP to do that. I guess the Saga of the Bear could be okay in specific circumstances, although most of the time I don't think it'd really be worth it, but maybe if you had, say, a 2 wound Space Marine squad being hit by a whole bunch of damage to attacks, then that could be enough to make a difference. Next up for 1 command point, there's Death Howl. This gives you a 6 inch consolidation after you've destroyed an enemy unit, and you must use it to end with an engagement range of another enemy unit. Again, situationally handy this one, if your opponent has maybe spread their units out enough so you can't just wipe one and then tag the other one anyway, this could make the difference. If it stops a whole bunch of enemy infantry with powerful guns from shooting in the next turn, then that could well be worth 1 CP. With the Saga of Majesty, it could also trigger a Battleshock test, but I'd consider that a lesser benefit. Finally, for 1 CP, there's Relentless Assault. This one allows you to advance and shoot, or fall back and shoot. Pretty handy for any ranged units out there, maybe particularly infantry that could have their damage output ruined, or if you desperately need to move on to an objective and still keep up your firepower. This one gets next level with the Saga of the Warrior Born, giving you advance and charge as well. And I guess for 2 CP, that could give you an advance and charge special rule if it was going to be valuable enough to make the difference. Advancing and shooting is definitely something that comes up from time to time, particularly for if it makes a difference between getting range or line of sight from one of your heavy hitters onto a key enemy one. The advance and charge thing is really good if you've got Warrior Born active, though it's quite a lot less reliable to get advance and charge compared with other detachments out there like Stormlance or Gladius. Overall, I feel like quite a lot of the stratagems do have a downside by being locked to the sagas, which as mentioned are kind of unreliable in the first place. Most of them feel just merely okay if you don't have a saga active. I'd rate all of them as usable, but just not reliably super good or exciting, not until you've got the relevant saga active for the stratagem. Finally, we've got the four enhancements. The Pelt of the Beowulf is 10 points, and this one is a relic that hands out a Battleshock test in the fight phase. In my opinion, really not very good unless you've just got 10 points left that you can't spend on anything else. The opponent could easily just pass the Battleshock test most of the time, and even then it's mainly going to be good just for preventing stratagems, which might be something that your opponent was thinking about, or might totally not be. For 25 points, there's Black Death. This gives a unit anti-vehicle and anti-monster 4+, plus for their melee weapons, a fairly significant boost for things like Thunder Hammers with the Devastating Wounds. It means that you get Devastating Wounds against those targets against a 4+, plus, which is pretty massive. Maybe worth it on a Wolf Lord with a Thunder Hammer for that kind of cost though. The Wolf Tail Talisman is 20 points and this gives minus 1 damage for the bearer, so a personal durability boost there. Not terrible, but kind of underwhelming for 20 points I'd say. I guess maybe could be okay for something like a lone operative combi weapon lieutenant perhaps, or maybe something really quite big and tanky like a Wolf Lord on Thunder Wolf. For anything that's leading a unit though, it's not really going to be relevant unless the bodyguard's actually wiped out. Finally, for 15 points, there's a Frost Weapon, Precision Melee, and plus 1 Strength, and an extra AP minus 1. Could be fun to have a Power Fist that's Strength 9, AP 3, and has the ability to try and snipe characters. 
Again, seems harmless enough for 15 points if you had them left over. Doesn't really quite seem strong enough to really plan or build around though. Just maybe a slightly incidental nice to have. Out of these, I'd probably rate Black Death on a Thunderhammer character as maybe the most interesting. It does make them genuinely very threatening against tough targets. The rest all seem kind of fine to have if you have the points left over, but nothing quite as exciting in my opinion. Overall, unfortunately for the Champions of Ross, this just really doesn't add up to being particularly strong for Space Wolves in-game at the moment. Despite being the fun and fluffy index attachment for the chapter that people absolutely would use if it was any good, they really don't. At tournaments, the Storm Lance is by far the most popular detachment, and things like Gladius and Iron Storm are also played in favour of Champions of Ross. I'd say perhaps the biggest strength is if that you could get the Sagas rolling early through some sort of cleverness and good planning. Potentially you could have an army that's got some very serious buffs going by turn 3 or turn 4, and that would in turn make a bunch of the stratagems go from kind of weedy to kind of great. Overall though, I just don't really feel like it's particularly well balanced at the moment. Could be one for Games Workshop to take a look at in a future balance update perhaps if they feel like they want to. Maybe doing something like making the sagas a little bit easier to achieve, or starting with one of them active could be one of the ways that they could go perhaps. Otherwise though, let's get into Space Wolf data sheets. As mentioned, compared with most of the other Divergent chapters out there, they have more. Lots of unique infantry squads, the equivalent of several of the old school space marines from the past. Wolf and Thunderwolves, unique Dreadnoughts and Flyers, and then a rather mighty cast of characters, both with unique named ones and a bunch of generic ones. Starting out, I thought we'd start with a unit that maybe feels like the star of the show at the moment for the Space Wolves in-game, and that's everyone's favourite wolves riding wolves in the Thunderwolf cavalry. Fenris's legendary formation of wolf riders. The Thunderwolves are 90 points for 3 of them, or 180 for 6, and for those costs you get some seriously well-rounded cavalry. They're both pretty fast at 10 inch movement, really quite tough with 4 wounds at toughness 6, with a 4 plus invulnerable save from storm shields, and then their damage output in melee I'd say is easily good enough. 7 attacks between wolf and rider at strength 5, AP 1 and damage 1, but it gets more well-rounded again on the charge, and goes up to damage 2. That increase in damage rule on the charge also applies to any attached characters, whether it's Wolfguard Battle Leaders, Harold Deathwolf, or even Logan Grimnar and Stormrider. Basically, these guys do seem to be pretty much the unit for Space Wars right now. A load of competitive lists building around them as the primary damage dealers, and often having Wolf Lords or Battle Leaders join onto them to make the squad a bit more well rounded. The lethal hits definitely helps them out with the Battle Leaders. They're particularly great in Storm Lance as well, the most commonly played Space Wolves detachment currently. Both being mounted and having heavy melee makes them really good with their synergies. Otherwise though, let's move on to the Space Wolf Infantry. The Impetuous Blood Claws are 140 points for 10 or 210 for 15. Young and Brash Space Wolves that get a lot of chainsaw attacks. And are really quite cheap for Marine Body Profiles with just 14 points per model. Not bad for a 2 wound Space Marine with Objective Control 2. You can put a lot of bodies and wounds on the board. Their chainsaws are better than most, getting plus 1 attack and plus 1 strength on the charge and that buff also confers to any characters attached. The pack leader can take a power fist, you can have two special weapons in the squad, and they work really quite nice with Ulrich the Slayer in particular. He can potentially give them full re-rolls to hit and wound against certain targets, and between all that you've both got a unit that's really quite tough, really got quite a lot of objective control, and pretty dangerous against a lot of medium-sized targets in the game. I definitely rate them as a usable and interesting squad. Otherwise, for their slightly more seasoned brethren, the Grey Hunters, they're 85 points for 5 or 170 per 10, basically the Grey Knight's tactical squad and the counter such for character attachment. A little bit pricier than the tactical marines, but at least you can field them in smaller numbers if you want to, and their main advantage is both getting a bolt gun and an Astartes chainsword, displaying a bit of that true grit with the bolter and chainsword wielding. Beyond that, they get two special weapons in the squad, and the sergeant gets a power fist, really quite a lot of gear for a cheap 5-man squad. Their special rule allows them to advance and shoot and fall back and shoot. Not too bad if they're wanting to advance towards midfield objectives turn 1 maybe. Overall I'd rate them as usable enough skirmishers. You probably don't want too many of them in an army as they're not going to be your core damage dealers. But they're fairly cheap and pack a bit more of a threat than some. I'd probably weigh them up against intercessors and what they can bring to the table with things like sticky objectives. The Sky Claws are the Blood Claws that have found themselves a jump pack to hurtle towards the enemy at breakneck speed. Really quite a big assault squad with 5 to 15 models in them. I guess theoretically the way to make these at the moment is to combine the Games Workshop Jump Pack kit with the Blood Claws kit. 
Their stat lines are kind of similar to the jump pack intercessors, though they do get one less attack with their chainsaws. Besides that, they can have two special weapons per squad, so you could have two plasma guns or two melter guns per unit of five of them. The sergeant can take a power fist again, and their special rule is re-rolling charge rolls and plus one to hit on the charge as well, so that both the jump intercessors and the blood claws, they do hit harder when they're charging in. Overall, not too terrible as an alternative to the jump intercessors. The two units both definitely have positives, with the jump intercessors having their mortal wound impact hits and slightly better melee. They are slightly cheaper as well. I guess the main draw to the sky claws is the two free special weapons and re-rolling charges. I'd probably rate the jump intercessors a little bit higher, just literally due to being a bit cheaper, but still feels like there's room for these guys, really. Next up, for 150 points, there are the long fangs, or 180 if you want an extra heavy weapon in the squad. These guys are the Space Wolf Devastators, veterans long in the tooth, as the name would suggest. Their stat line is broadly kind of similar to a standard Devastator squad. Even if you take six models in the unit, they all get heavy weapons besides the pack leader, though he can take a special weapon instead, so it's maybe a bit more threat than the standard Devastator one. Instead of ignoring cover, they get two reroll hit rolls of one against one enemy unit if they're static, and have that same Armorium Cherub rule to get one hit roll to be an unmodified six, and otherwise are probably most interesting with either Las Cannons, Multi Melters, or Grav Cannons, depending on the battlefield role that you want to use them for. Overall, I must admit I think they're a bit overcosted at this kind of points cost right now. They're significantly pricier than Devastators, and they don't tend to get run very often competitively. Even with their shooting bonuses, I feel like you're probably better off with something else. For some Space Wolf Elites, we have the Wolf Guard, 95 points for 5 of them, or 190 for 10. They count as Stone Guard Veteran Squads for character attachment now, so are quite flexible with character attachment. These guys get to be Leadership 5 for some reason, so are unusually brave. And in general, I'd want to run them with Heirloom Weapons plus Storm Shields, giving them a 4 plus Invulnerable save and then a whole bunch of strength 5, AP 1, damage 1 attacks in close combat. When a character's leading them, they get plus 1 to hit, so we'll be hitting with those attacks on a 2+, plus, which is quite nice. And at least in theory, they could be another interesting and actually fairly tanky, cheap unit for a character to join. A squad that's skewing themselves to being a bit better against killing light infantry, but not quite as good against things with high armor saves as, say, Blade Guard. I guess not everything can join Blade Guard units, so they might have some look in there. They'd also have to compete against things like company heroes for captains out there. They do feel somewhat similar in a similar points bracket with good defensive stats. Overall, maybe just a little bit niche without being particularly strong at punching up against heavier targets. For their Terminator Armoured Brothers, there's the Wolfguard Terminator Squad. 195 points for 5 of them, or 390 for 10. A little bit more expensive than the standard Codex Terminator Squad. And they count as those for the purposes of any character attachment. Their main advantage is that they can mix and match their war gear, so you could have terminators with storm shields mixed with power fists or thunder hammers and things, and still get the option to take a heavy weapon in the unit. So in general, if you're thinking about a terminator assault squad, I'd be a bit more tempted to take these instead. Otherwise, for their special rule, they get the same plus one to hit against the oath of moment targets that the regular ones do. But unlike the regular terminators, they manage to keep their ignores modifier special rule. So we'll usually be hitting on their normal ballistic skill or weapon skill, even if the enemy has stealth or something. Overall, between all that, I feel like they have a niche against the other two flavours of Terminator. Probably a little bit better than the Terminator Assault Squad, thanks to packing a Cyclone Missile Launcher or something on a squad with a very similar loadout. Maybe a little bit more balanced against the regular squad, given the slightly cheaper points that they have. Either way, they're not really considered quite as much the star damage dealers of the book compared with the Thunderwolves right now. They could be kind of usable for small units or in more casual games. Next up are the Hounds of Morkai, 90 points for 5 of them or 180 for 10. These guys get 5 to 10 models in the squad and count as Reavers for character attachment. They get very similar stats to Reavers, but get a 6 plus invulnerable save at base, improving to a 4 plus against Psychic. For their war gear options, they're locked to the bolt pistol and knife loadout, but compared with Reavers, they also get devastating wounds, which just makes them generally a lot more threatening against anything out there, and also anti psyker 4+, plus, making them particularly good against enemy sorcerers and witches. Finally, for their Battleshock debuff, they get to use Morkai's Howl, a Battleshock test to 12 inches, and if it's against a psyker, it's minus 1 to that test, and if they're debuffed, then psyche attacks get minus 1 to hit as well. Perhaps their biggest weakness compared with Reavers is that they can't take grav shoots, so can't be deep striking in, sadly. 
If they could, then I feel like they'd be really quite tempting. Otherwise, having to start on the board, I feel like they're a bit more meta-dependent, depending on whether or not you're going to be fighting loads of psychers out there. If you can guarantee that you're going to be matching up against psychers a good deal of the time, then they might well be worth it. If not, then they're maybe losing their unique selling point versus the massive amount of other Space Marine units in the same sort of class you could build. Next up are the Wolf Scouts, which are kind of weirdly overcosted right now. 5 to 10 models for 85 or 170 points. Similar profiles to the Scouts, but for some reason only with one wound, not two. Kind of surprising that Games Workshop haven't fixed that one by now. Otherwise, for being massively more expensive than a Scout Squad and far less durable, their main selling point is getting a special weapon and a power weapon on the Sergeant. Basically, they're just all around hugely inferior to regular Scouts that do what they do, but much better given the extra toughness that they have, and also far cheaper at 55 points versus 85. Next up are the Devolved Space Wolves of the Wolfen, 80 points for 5 of them, or 160 per 10. These guys are in kind of a weird place, they do have good stats as per their points cost, which is only 16 points per model. They're fairly fast moving at 8 inches, 2 wounds at toughness 5 with a 4 plus save that could be an invulnerable save with the Storm Shield, but their melee damage is the same as quite a lot of other Space Wolves out there, Lots of hits at strength 5 and AP 1, which is good against lighter infantry, but against anything toughness 6 or higher saves, they're going to struggle quite a lot. Perhaps their biggest problem is that they have objective control 0, which is a fairly huge flaw. Unlike other units that could be scrapping over objectives and then hope to take them, these guys won't be able to. Though, given all their advantages, plus a 6 plus feel no pain, and the ability to fight on death on a 4 plus, they should trade with other cheaper enemy infantry units really quite effectively. Their threat for the cost really is quite good and they are very cheap. I'd probably take the Storm Shield for the extra survivability myself, but given objective control zero, you wouldn't really want too many of them in an army, maybe a small unit or two. Next up, for 30 points for 5 or 60 points for 10, are the Fenrisian Wolves, a really quite cheap beast unit with a whole bunch of toughness 4 and 6 plus save bodies. They move quite fast at 10 inches and they can charge after they advance, attacking with a couple of attacks at strength 4 and AP 0. They are also objective control 0, so they're not going to be taking primary objectives, but at just 30 points they really are quite good for screening and secondary objective type things. You could put them into strategic reserve to have them turn up to do certain position specific secondaries, or things that require you to do something similar to an action. For those reasons, as well as just being nuisance screening units that can get in the way, I think it's rarely the worst idea to maybe have one or two units of them in an army list. Again, definitely not to go too heavy on them, but they are really quite good for objective things. Otherwise, as a potential upgrade for the Fenrisian Wolves, there's the Cyber Wolf. 20 points, and it must attach to a unit of Fenrisian Wolves, so you can't just field it solo. It's got the stat line of a regular wolf, but bigger. 2 wounds rather than 1. 4 attacks at strength 4 rather than 2. And he gives the Wolves the Scout 6 inches ability to get them into the midfield, and a buff against injured enemy units. He does have the big disadvantages of making a Fenrisian Wolf squad nowhere near as cheap as it was though, and I sort of feel like if you get into a 50 point unit you might be better off with scouts instead. I do like the way that you've specified that this guy can't be made your warlord and can't be given enhancements either. There will be something pretty funny about putting the bionic dog in charge of everything. Moving on to Space Wolf vehicles next, I thought we'd start with the Dreadnoughts before talking about their planes and then going through to the rest of their characters. Heading up the Dreadnoughts in style is Bjorn the Fell Handed, 180 points and really quite a tanky dreadnought. He does have only the 8 wounds and no invulnerable save, but he gets a 5 plus feel no pain and gets to half the damage of attacks that hit him. And between the two, you can make very high damage attacks turn into very low damage attacks. Otherwise, compared with standard dreadnoughts, he moves 8 inches, gets the standard choice of lots of heavy weapons, and the choice of a Hellfrost cannon if he wants it, with its curious strength 5 attack. Probably the Torrent Flamer is the more useful bit though. In combat he hits with a bunch of strength of 12 attacks with lethal hits with true claw, and then he comes built in with one of those ruin a stratagem type rules, increasing one battle tactic stratagem by 1 CP after the opponent has used it the first time. Overall really quite strong for 180 points I think, could be interesting enough within the Champions of Rust attachment as a character that could potentially be killing some fairly serious things. Otherwise Murder Fang is 170 points, a crazed wolf and dreadnought with a 6 plus feel no pain and objective control 0. This one also moves 8 inches. He's nowhere near as hard to kill but hits spectacularly hard in melee. 8 twin linked attacks at strength 14, AP 2 and damage 3 is thoroughly murderous and he can tank shock very well if he needs more mortal wounds. 
Then he has the special rule murder maker, which means that each time he's attacked, he can either shoot or fight. And potentially if the enemy approaches him wrong, then that could give a serious amount of extra melee damage. So they need to think a bit carefully about how they manage to destroy him. Probably the biggest issue is his durability though, and he's almost certainly going to be taking at least some damage before he hits the enemy lines with an 8 inch move and not being able to go through terrain and things. Maybe kind of interesting as a counter charge threat if he can hide him behind some midfield ruins, but could just get shot down relatively easily if he's just moving up the board. Still though, I do think that he's kind of interesting just for the sheer amount of carnage. Next up is the Space Wolf's Venerable Dreadnought for 155 points. This one's a bit more normal in the Dreadnought stats, only having a 6 inch movement and no feel no pain unfortunately. There's two main things to sell this guy, access to the Hellfrost Cannon, Blizzard Shield and the Fembrizian Great Axe. The Great Axe is kind of fun having a sweep and strike type mode, though it does mean it wouldn't be quite as strong against toughness 11 or 12. Otherwise the Blizzard Shield gives him a 4 plus invulnerable save, so quite good against last cannons or other high AP things. And his Wisdom of the Ancient special rule gets the Venerable Dreadnought version of this, allowing a nearby infantry to re-roll hit rolls and wound rolls of one, rather than just hit rolls as the standard Loyalist Dreadnought gets. Overall I'd say the main thing to sell him is that infantry boosting special rule, given that his raw damage and defence for 155 points I just don't think is particularly great. Maybe if it made sense for Space Wolves to play with a slow moving infantry castle of some sort, then he could well be worth it to have one copy of standing in the middle of all that. In general though, he tends to get fairly rarely plays. Finally for unique dreadnoughts, we've got the Wolfen Dreadnought, by far the cheapest at 130. He's got some similarities to Murderfang with the Feel No Pain, 8 inch move and objective control 0. And then he gets to choose between a Great Wolf Claw and Fenrisian Great Axe paired with a Blizzard Shield. And his special rule is a Mortal Wound Impact Hit Spawn, which could do for a few more enemy infantry alongside his mainline damage. I have seen people occasionally using these competitively, though not usually en masse or anything. A fairly cheap distraction dreadnought that can cause some fairly serious carnage if the opponent doesn't shoot it down, though objective control zero is a bit unfortunate. For the flyers next, and first up we have the Stormfang gunship at the fairly brutally expensive price of 300 points. For that you get a 14 wound toughness 10 flyer with a 3 plus save. And unfortunately for 300 points that durability is just kind of standout bad really. A few high power enemy anti-tank shots could fairly easily ping this guy out of the sky. He does at least get some interesting weapons though. Potentially two sets of twin multi-melters are genuinely very threatening to enemy armour. Plus some missiles and that very big Hellfrost cannon. D3 shots at strength 11, AP3 and damage 7 on the tank busting profile is seriously scary. On top of that, if you do hit something with the Hellfrost Destructor and you don't destroy it, if it's a monster or vehicle, you also get to slow it down, subtracting two from movement, advance and charges, which could be disruptive if it's something quite big and scary. It can also transport six models as well, so you could deliver a small squad to the front line. Overall, I feel like its damage is fine, and maybe if you could get a couple of turns shooting out of it without it being destroyed, then maybe it could be worth it. In general though, it just feels like a few too many points in a big and kind of fragile basket. If the opponent's got long range anti-tank, then it could very easily just crash and burn turn 1. Otherwise, its transport counterpart is the Storm Wolf. 50 points less, with a big transport capacity of 16, so you could put a very big squad at the front of the enemy army. Its guns aren't quite as threatening as the gunship as you'd probably expect, though it can still be fairly punchy with the twin-linked multi-melters up close to deal with enemy tanks and monsters. Its special rule is that it allows your unit in size to advance and charge if they disembarked before this thing moved, though that does kind of feel like you're just passing up the very good movement of the flyer before you drop, though I suppose it at least gives you options. Seems maybe hard to justify too much compared with a land raider if you want to deliver melee units to the front really. They're a bit tougher and despite being ground bound can deliver melee threats a bit further. Again this thing's not particularly tough for the cost either. Finally we get to the many and varied Space Wolf characters. First up we've got Logan Grimnar who you can field in two different configurations, either 100 points in this Terminator armour or mounted on his Storm Rider sleigh. The Great Wolf of the Space Wolves is fairly dangerous in combat with 6 attacks at strength 8 and damage 3, but by far the biggest reason to take him on the board I think is his single massive turn of rerolls army wide. Once per game he can use his High King of Fenris rule and allow your entire army to re-roll charge rolls and hit rolls in melee when they get there. That's really quite big across an entire army when it might be committing to melee en masse and as a result he might be more tempting in bigger games where that rule might be able to go further and affect yet more combats and charges. 
Overall, any sort of board wide effects for 100 points is kind of interesting. I feel like he's got enough melee punch to back that up. Otherwise, he could be fielded on Storm Rider as an alternative, an extra 80 points, and that doubles his wound count, plus allows him to lead Thunderwolves, plus he gets the teeth and claw attacks of the Thunderwolves pulling his chariots. Otherwise, he's fairly similar. If you destroy an enemy unit, you gain 1 CP with him, like the foot version, and he could be potentially hitting a bit harder than the foot version if he's leading Thunderwolves, as he'd be able to take the advantages of things like Wolfguard battle leaders, or the plus 1 damage on the charge that Thunderwolves gets. That could perhaps make his sweep mode a bit more interesting. Overall seems okay as an alternative. All the characters do seem to be a bit more favoured to lead Thunderwolves more so than him though. Next for 85 points there's Nyar Stormcaller. He's Terminator armoured and can lead all the squads that you can expect. A 5 wound character and with his Stormcalling duties he can shroud his squad for a minus 1 to hit. Attacks with Living Lightning with a bunch of Strength 7, AP 1 and Damage 1 shots. And then the staff of the Stormcaller also gets sustained hits too as well. Between all that, he seems kind of fine to lead a Terminator squad if you want a character. Minus one to hit is fine. And he can add a bit more threat against hordes on the shooting front of things. I feel like perhaps he's not significantly better than things like Chaplains for a plus one to wound. Or the Terminator Captain for free stratagems on them though. Seems usable but maybe not standout. Next up we have the enormous champion that is Arjat Rockfist for 95 points. His foe hammer strikes with 5 attacks at strength 8 and damage 3 with anti-monster 2+, plus Plus he also gets to throw it as well. A single attack with the same profile that shoots at 6 inches. He gives extra damage as the squad takes casualties to his unit. Maybe that could be okay in a really big scary terminator unit perhaps. Plus 1 to hit if they're below starting strength and plus 1 to wound if they're below half strength. Otherwise he can use epic challenge to get precision melee for 0 CP if you want to. And if the enemy unit contains characters in it, you get to re-roll the hit roll and the wound roll, really taking him to the next level in terms of combat threat. Between all that, he really does seem quite dangerous to have in a Terminator squad, and he could have him alongside something like a Captain or Logan Grimnar. Again though, he does have a fair bit of competition, and he can also take the generic Wolfgar battle leader in Terminator armour as another option besides him. Speaking of which, while we're on the Terminators, the Wolfguard Battle Leader is basically a Lieutenant, but for a Terminator squad, he grants lethal hits to Terminators, which is quite nice for the sort of mid-strength Power Fist and Thunder Hammers. And besides that, just gets flexible war gear and helps protect any other character in the squad with a 4 plus feel no pain, giving them a little bit more resilience against nasty precision attacks. Fairly simple and effective, lethal hits is really quite a nice boost. And I guess in theory he could make the Gladius Task Force Fire Discipline work on Terminators with this guy. With a whole bunch of Cyclone missiles plus a load of Storm Bolter Fire. Again seems an interesting leader for them and fairly well balanced versus the rest. On to some power armoured characters next and first up we have Auric the Slayer. The Wolf Priest is 70 points and he fights in close combat with his Artificer Crozius at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2 and also gets a plasma pistol. He's somewhat limited in the units that he can bring, maybe Blood Claws or Wolf Guard being the most interesting given his melee boosting special rules, where in combat he does add really quite a lot to his unit's damage output. Reroll hit rolls and wound rolls of 1, which usually equates to a 35% damage increase, but then if you happen to be in combat against either an enemy character, vehicle or monster unit, then instead of that already fairly good special rule, it gets replaced by reroll all hits and wounds. That's a pretty crazy damage increase against a lot of things that you are quite likely to be fighting against. He seems particularly strong paired with Blood Claws, loads of cheap mid-strength melee attacks on the charge, and he makes his own combat ability really quite scary as well with those kind of re-rolls in play. Overall does seem quite fun, paired with a cheapish unit to punch up surprisingly hard. Next up we have the primary space wolf that is Ragnar Blackmane. 90 points for this wolf lord captain, and he's got a bit more choice of units that he can join having the options of Intercessors and Blade Guard as well. He's a 5 wound Tacticus armoured character with a 4 plus and vulnerable save, and he strikes in combat with Frostfang, his Relic Chainsword, a massive 8 attacks at strength 6, AP 3 and damage 2, utterly brutal at killing enemy marines in particular, and on top of that he even gets sustained hits 1, and plus 2 attacks on the charge as well, a big 10 attacks some of the time. Otherwise, besides his raw melee power, the only thing that he gives for his squad at the moment is the ability to advance and charge. Definitely helpful for these on-the-board foot units. Could perhaps be nice to get Blade Guard into combat, but maybe not quite as standard as things that actually help the damage output of their squad. 
and could be kind of redundant in a few detachments like Stormlance or Gladius, where it's not really too hard to get your hands on advance and charge anyway. His personal combat stats are quite impressive though. Next up, for 65 points, we've got Crom Dragon Gaze, a wolf lord that can join Blood Claws, Grey Hunters, or Wolf Guard, a 4 wound captain model with some strength 7, AP minus 2, and damage 2 attacks, or with lethal hits, so fairly quite well rounded there. He gets a similar special rule to Arjak, with the ability to get plus 1 to hit if you've taken casualties, and plus 1 to wound if the squad's below half strength and the chance to give a Battleshock test to enemy infantry within 12 inches. He is quite cheap and perhaps surprisingly fighty for a 65 point character. In general though I think he's going to struggle to compete against the other Space Wolves and generic characters out there. He just doesn't really help out his squad quite as reliably. In 40k there's at least a fair chance that by the time you've taken casualties you might still have the entire unit wiped, and Power Armoured Space Wolves maybe a bit more so than the tankier Terminators. Next up, Lucas the Trickster is a cheap character to lead Blood Claws at 50 points, 4 wounds with no invulnerable save, and he strikes with the Claw of the Jackal Wolf, a 6 attack lightning claw with strength 5, AP minus 2 and damage 1. His thing is to give his Blood Claw unit a minus 1 to hit, an okay durability boost against shooting but won't help in melee, and then when he dies he gets the fun chance to explode for his heart that's replaced with a grenade. A 4 plus chance to battleshock the enemy unit that just slew him in melee and also deal them d6 mortal wounds for good measure. He is quite cheap and quite fun and I feel like for 50 points isn't the worst in the world. I feel like for the most part they could probably do better with other leaders though. Things like lieutenants to help them punch up against Tovastoff with lethal hits or Ulrich the Slayer for his big rerolls. Next up we've got the Iron Priest. A 60 point basically unique tech marine for the space wolves given that they have the unique model for him. He's got similar stats to the primaris tech marine but comes with some slightly different war gear. Instead he gets a Hellfrost pistol for one fairly scary strength 6 AP 3 and damage 3 shot or a light flamer. And then in combat he's got fairly punchy melee stats, 4 attacks total at strength 8 AP 2 damage 3. Medium infantry units definitely have to fear him a little bit. He can lead squads, but is perhaps more likely to be seen just following vehicles around as they give him lone operative style protection. And he has the same Space Marine Tech Marine standard sort of special rule, getting plus 1 to hit and healing D3 wounds on his target. Quite nice for buffing something big and scary like, say, a Redemptor or Ballista's Dreadnought, or a Repulsor or Executioner. As with the standard Primaris Tech Marine, you get a Nerd Raid special rule called Vengeance of the Omnisire. If you break one of his favourite toys near him and destroy a nearby Astartes vehicle, he goes up to attacks characteristic 6, so that's a pretty scary 7 damage 3 attacks there, which is fairly fearsome. Definitely capable of making his presence felt if he's got a squad to counter charge after that happens. Overall for 60 points, I'd say he's fairly equivalent to the standard Space Marine Tech Marine. Slightly scarier combat stats perhaps, but he does cost 5 points more and doesn't come with the bonus heavy bolter. Either of them work kind of fine in an Iron Storm Spearhead. If you have an extra 5 points left over, I feel like he's not the worst upgrade in the world. Lastly for the infantry characters, we've got 3 flavours of Wolfguard Pack Leader. The bonus model that Space Wolves have generally been able to field alongside their various unique infantry units, having some fairly punchy stats and special weapons. The standard one costs 30 points and can go with Blood Claws, Grey Hunters and Long Fangs, maybe pack another Power Fist or something, and allow the units to reroll Battleshock tests. In general I feel like these are an option where you just want, say, a unit but more, or want to tailor them a little bit more to having scary close combat weapons. I guess maybe if you put one in a Blood Claw unit, then having an extra Power Fist could be interesting to trigger their special rule I suppose. Games Workshop do seem to have made it, so you can't do anything particularly gamey with them, like you can't feel them on their own and they can't be made Warlord or given enhancements, they basically just do what they do on their raw stats. Otherwise, there's an alternative flavour of them for a jump pack one, again just a similar two wound character with the same sort of special rules and ignoring battle shock. He can only join Sky Claws, so can't go with things like the jump intercessors unfortunately. Finally, and perhaps the most interesting out of any of the pack leaders, is the Wolfguard pack leader in Terminator armour. He's 40 points and can take a Cyclone Missile Launcher, and it's kind of interesting that he can join the Blood Claws, Grey Hunters or Long Fangs, both giving them an extra tough model and a couple of extra missile shots hidden within the unit. Overall I think he's really quite good value for his points. Standard Terminator profiles tend to run at around this sort of cost anyway, and getting the special one with the extra shooty guns is nice, even if he does have kind of lacklustre close combat only getting 2 attacks when regular Terminators get 3 with their power fists. I feel like perhaps his choice of unit might be the biggest thing that's letting him down, 
Could be fun in blood claws, I suppose. Theoretically, the missiles should pair well with long fangs, but they are just very expensive at 150 points. Overall, I've seen occasional people making use of these guys. I'd be most tempted by the Terminator one compared with the others, though. Finally, for the Space Wolf characters, we perhaps get into the really interesting ones, or the Thunder Wolf mounted ones that can lead the scariest unit in the index right now. Two special characters and two generic ones. Harold Death Wolf is 85 points and is a 7 wound wolf lord on Thunder Wolf. He gets 6 attacks with Glacius and buffs the units to get devastating wounds when they make a charge move, but only on the Thunder Wolf's crushing teeth and claws. Even with that though, that's still really quite spooky, he'll get quite a lot of those attacks, and they'll all be damaged 2 on the charge. Otherwise, he'll personally be damaged 3 on the charge as well, and his mantle of the Troll King gives him a little bit of extra durability. Once per phase, after you've failed a saving throw for him, you can change the damage characteristic to 0. A good durability boost there, and it makes him more survivable than most. Overall, he is certainly considered a competitive character. Lots of Thunderwolf heavy Stormlance type lists tend to make use of him. Otherwise, for 75 points, there's Canis Wolfborn. He's got the option to lead some Fenrisian Wolves if you'd like some cheaper bullet catchers for him, as well as joining the mighty Thunderwolves. Though out of any of the Thunderwolf characters, he's the only one that you can't combine in the same squad as another character, as he's neither a captain nor has the battle leader type rules. He's a 6 wound character without an invulnerable save, unlike the Thunderwolf Lords. He attacks with 8 attacks at strength 5, AP 2 and twin linked with his lightning claws, They'll get damage too if they charge if he's leading a unit of the cavalry. And his special rules are to give them sustained hits 1. And some really quite punchy mortal wounds on the charge move. Usually around about D3 or 3 of them. With a small chance for more. Overall between all that for just 75 points I do think he's really quite strong. Sustained hits maybe doesn't feel quite as useful as lethal hits that the battle leader will be able to give you. But it's still good. His melee on the charge is really quite scary. As is that mortal wound burst. Overall seems kind of fine if you're not wanting to build out every single squad with two characters. 75 points seems pretty good for his overall abilities. Next up, for a bit costlier, we have the Wolf Lord on Thunderwolf. He's 100 points with a 6 wound character with a 4 plus invulnerable save. Often possibly fielded with a Storm Shield to increase that to 7 wounds. And then either a Thunder Hammer or Power Fist or maybe a Relic Weapon to back that all up. He gives plus one to advance and charge for his unit, which is really quite big in Stormlands, as he can do both. Could be interesting if he turned up from reserve as well, potentially, giving you an 8-inch charge. And as per normal, for captain-style things, he gets you a free battle tactic stratagem each round. Could be big for command point re-rolling a charge, perhaps, and otherwise it depends a bit on the detachment that you're running. But most of the Codex ones tend to be okay. Again, he does seem to be run really quite consistently competitively. Hard to go wrong with a big scary fighty character with free stratagems and a movement boost, adding some quality melee into the Thunderwolf cavalry that might struggle with harder targets or high saves otherwise. Finally, we've got the Wolfguard Battle Leader on Thunderwolf. He's a 5 wound character that can still get a 4 plus invulnerable save with the Storm Shield, which is a good idea to take. Again, perhaps backed up with either a Relic Weapon or Power Fist or Thunder Hammer. As with other lieutenants in 40k, he gives the unit a lethal hits boost. Great for the standard Thunderwolf attacks that all hit at strength 5 and might really struggle with toughness 10 or higher otherwise, and certainly helps out his own attacks and potentially another attached character to the unit like a Thunderwolf Lord. His other special rule is a reactive once per game d6 movement when the unit gets shot, and you are allowed to use it to potentially jump the squad into melee with an enemy unit, which could be really quite a significant thing. Say if the Thunderwolves have moved up towards an objective and the opponent have moved something to contest it but not necessarily charge, he might be able to interrupt the enemy's shooting phase by hiding your big Thunderwolf unit in combat and potentially butchering the enemy unit and keeping them safe for the rest of that turn. Overall, absolutely great value. At 80 points, I'd probably argue that he might be the single best value character for the Thunderwolf cavalry. Really quite cheap, plenty fighty enough, and lethal hits is great. Overall, the Space Wolves definitely have a whole ton of character units. The ones I'd probably rate the strongest would be the Thunderwolf ones, just due to the relevance of the unit, and otherwise Logan Grimnar, particularly the version on foot I think is really quite good value, giving you some big cross-board rerolls, and besides that Bjorn the Fell-Handed and Auric the Slayer I both think are really quite nice for their cost. Space Wolves get access to basically the entire rest of the Space Marine Codex though, within their own detachment they get a couple of units locked out, but outside of that, say if they're playing Iron Storm or Stormlance or something else, they can basically take absolutely what they want. 
I won't go into masses of detail about the things that are considered strong for space marines, it will vary detachment to detachment, but just in general, inceptors are hard to go wrong with with units to drop down and score points, infiltrators are great for babysitting home field objectives and denying deep strike, scouts are just incredibly cheap and great to have for the objective game and trading, and aggressors are really quite powerful, maybe charging out of a land raider, and more so in certain detachments like Gladius or Firestorm. There's plenty of other strong usable stuff out there though, eradicators could do some strong anti-tank, eliminators are kind of fine for the midfield, or even things like intercessors just for sticky objectives. Otherwise, characters definitely have a lot of competition from the Space Wolves unique ones, though I guess they are particularly relevant if you're playing Champions of Ross, you'd want to go really quite heavy on the character data sheets, and sometimes the generic one might fit the bill a bit better compared with a Space Wolves unique one, perhaps access to things like the other chaplains or librarians, things like that. You could use the Phobos Lieutenant or even allied assassins like the Callers to go jumping around the board doing secondary objectives and being disruptive lone operatives. Otherwise, for vehicles, Lamb Raiders can be good for delivering combat units. Things like Aggressors or maybe Blade Guard with Ragnar Blackmane could do well with those. Rhinos might be more usable than just about any other Space Marine chapter given the option to deliver some furious blood claws into the fight. Whirlwinds are solid for a bit of ignored line of sight shooting. And there's plenty of options for efficient firepower, the Ballista's Dreadnought, the Dual Roll Redemptor, Gladiator Lancers, or maybe the Vindicator. Even if a Space Wolf army is going for primarily melee, it often makes sense to have at least some things that can reach out and touch the things that are going to hurt you the most. Pick up any easy wins that are hiding in the backfield in the enemy army before they've got too much of a chance to inflict big casualties on you. Otherwise, in Codex Space Marines, there's plenty of options for other detachments. I won't go into literally all of them today, though I feel like the Stormland Space Wolves are worthy of a slide or of themselves. Given the Thunderwolf cavalry and how strong they are, Stormland seems to be the single most popular and successful way to run Space Wolves competitively. Kind of amusing in a way, seeing as this is the one that was kind of aimed towards white scars and has loads of things for mounted type units. However, the generic outriders and things are just too underwhelming for their points cost, so the Space Wolves reap all the benefits. The detachment allows you to advance and charge all the time, which is really quite handy. Particularly good for things like Thunderwolves with Thunderwolf Lords in. You'd have an average threat range of around about 22 or 23 inches, which is absolutely massive. And then there's lots of stratagems that are mostly dependent on the mounted keyword, things like a big durability minus one to hit and wound for a squad just about to get focused, a nasty reactive movement where you can move away from foes, maybe hide your unit or backpedal from charges, and a potentially big investment one for two command points for a massive advance nine inches automatically. That one costs a lot of resources, but it does mean that you might be able to make charges that otherwise you just couldn't have had a hope to reach. The enhancements, I'd say, are mostly usable, and you might want to throw them onto Wolf Lords or Battle Leaders. I feel like they're not the true selling point of the detachment, maybe. An optimised list tend to take three units of Thunder Wolves in this, often with maxed out Battle Leaders with lethal hits plus Wolf Lords in the units. I don't feel like you necessarily have to run literally three units of six Thunder Wolves, though it seems that a hefty proportion of armies choose to. Otherwise, beyond Stormlance, for the detachments that Space Wolves tend to run, the Gladius Task Force can also get you to advance and charge, which is rather big, has some useful stratagems like Lance Melee with extra AP, and can have that Fire Discipline combo, which is nice for aggressors, giving you a rather brutal shooting threat that's also very melee capable as well. Theoretically, you could use it on Terminators with a Wolfguard Battle Leader in it as well, giving you a different choice for something that you could Fire Discipline. That could be fairly scary with a whole bunch of Cyclone Missiles. Otherwise, the Iron Storm Spearhead is just generally strong regardless of chapter. For the most part, lists of this tend to revolve around heavy use of Dreadnoughts, plus maybe some Whirlwinds, Vindicators, Gladiator Lancers, that kind of thing. And I guess Space Wolves can contribute towards those a little bit, maybe putting in Beyond the Fell Handed, a Wolf and Dread, or Murder Fang perhaps. Plus, they do have their unique Tech Marine that can be used to bear some of the very good enhancements that the Iron Stormer can get. With Space Wolf unique units, you wouldn't necessarily have to go everything into vehicles as well. You could still have some scary Thunder Wars pushing up the board and hemming the enemy back while your tanks and vehicles and firepower get to work. Otherwise, for just generally strong Space Marine detachments, Firestorm and Vanguard also see play. Unfortunately for the Space Wolves, the Champions of Rust just really seems to be very nichely played with any sort of success on the tournament scene. There will still be people who turn up to it to other small or grand tournaments to represent Rust and the Allfather. 
Unfortunately, though, there does seem to be some pretty good consensus that it is just underpowered compared with multiple other options, and I feel like Games Workshop would do well to give it some sort of improvement at some stage, as it is perhaps a bit sad that the fluffy detachment for the chapter is just so underpowered compared with other things. Finally, I thought we'd just round up with one example of a successful Space Wolves list at a tournament, and this is one of the more recent ones by Nick Cochrane, who used it to take first at the Witch Trials GT. This one's pretty much a Maximal Thunderwolf style Space Wolf list, and it looks like he's chosen to back that up with more generic marine units as opposed to Space Wolf ones. I've seen plenty of similar lists like this that throw in other Space Wolf things, maybe Logan Grimnar, Bjorn the Fellhanders, some Blood Claws, or other fun units like that. For this one though, it looks like we are going for the three squads of Max Thunderwolves with Storm Shields, Harold Deathwolf and two Wolf Lords with Thunderwolves. They've both got Power Fist and Shields, and one takes the Fury of the Storm enhancement. That one gives the character a big damage boost on the charge. It'd be a strength 10 Power Fist with AP minus 4, which is pretty brutal, particularly when it's hitting on damage 3 thanks to the Thunderwolf special rules. Those three big units can make absolutely maximal use of the stratagems, depending on how aggressively the opponent deploys or if they move forward at all, they could absolutely be getting turn 1 charges. The Wolf Lords plus Advance and Charge, as we mentioned, give them around about 22 or 23 inch average threat range, and you could roll high. And there's stratagems for tanking a load of damage with minus 1 to hit and wound against shooting, and reactive moves and long advance moves, as we said. There's also a battle tactic one for Lance Melee as well, which could be nice for the Thunder Wolf Lords to trigger for free. Otherwise, while the scary wolf mounted cavalry go charging in and breaking things, there's also some fairly savage firepower in the list as well. Two Gladiator Lancers and one Gladiator Reaper. The Gladiator Lancers would certainly threaten to put down any one big armoured threat, and the Reaper could be good for clearing out some hordes. There's one unit of Infiltrators, as mentioned maybe good for holding the backfield with their Deep Strike Denial. One unit of Inceptors that's really handy for secondary objectives. And then interestingly enough, it looks like there's two units of Eliminators, one with Snipers and one with Last Fusals. And perhaps most confusingly for me, there seems to be a single Drop Pod in the list as well. I guess that's transporting either one or both of the Eliminators there. I'm really not too sure what the play or logic is for the drop pod. It'll give you a first turn thing to put down, maybe to get early secondaries, or perhaps hem back the enemy as the Thunderwolves are making their way up the board. Feel free to let me know what's going on with that if you have any insights. In any case, it looks really quite intimidating. Lots of very scary Space Wolves just charging their way up the board and breaking anything in the way. Really quite tough for the cost, and you could have that great durability strat active on multiple units with the Thunderwolf Lords, and then some good objective unit support, and some very serious firepower backing them up. Overall though, I think we'll leave that there for Space Wolves in Warhammer 40k. Let me know your thoughts on the faction down in the comments below, or any other insights, or things that I might have missed about playing them in-game. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel and you've been appreciating the long form content like this, then any support on the channel's Patreon page is massively appreciated. It is the main thing that allows me to keep these coming every day. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an absolutely massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.